Hello, my name is Justin Urquhart Stewart, and thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. And I am uh, we're working with regionally a business which has been set up to well, very simply as we put it here, rebuild regional investments together. Well, obviously with partners as well. So what we want to spend time today is actually explaining some of the key issues and opportunities and areas we need to be looking at. Why? Well, here we are coming out of the pandemic. And the country needs some investment. It needs a lot of investment. It needs a lot of investment to give it the vital word that runs any economy. Confidence. There's a certain shortage of that. But we've got a problem in Britain. And the big problem is that actually most of the investment you tend to find tends to go in, through and around London. What ever happened to the rest of the country? Uh, it may be a useless piece of information, but perfect for a pub quiz. But in 1945, we had 45 stock exchanges in this country. Uh, don't worry, they were mostly useless. But it was a mechanism for doing the primary purpose of a stock exchange, which is raising capital for business, not buying and selling shares. That's a sort of secondary thing. So actually, why should we be looking at that? Not so much stock exchanges, but finding a way in the way the regions can make sure they've got more capital coming in for those faster growing businesses, those smaller, medium sized businesses that need capital right now. Not going to get it from the banks necessarily, not going to get it from the city of London. Where are they going to get it from? So one of the key things is how can we connect investors of all sizes in all regions with businesses in their regions and also in others as well. So it's finds rather strange that we're almost reinventing something here, but putting something back, but using decent technology to do so. So here is the problem. How do we actually manage to establish this? Then actually, how do we get it working and actually make sure that people see some tangible benefit from it? Well, I'm pleased to say I'm joined today by three uh, experts in their own field or people with experience of actually what's happening. I'm delighted to say also helping us at Regionally to actually get this working and functioning. Because this initiative is starting off with the South and Southwest, but it will operate through all the regions of the United Kingdom in due course. The idea being that in due course you could even end up with, well, you have a FTSE 100 for the London Stock Exchange, why don't we have a Southwest 50 or whatever it happens to be? Regional funds highlighting regional companies, attracting therefore more companies, more investors into those regions. And that's actually what we want to try and achieve. So with me today, I'm pleased to say um, that I've got uh, Susanna Adams. Uh, Susanna Adams is a partner uh, with uh, Mr. Langdon and a firm of accountants for the region and uh, highly influential in it. Also, Matt Hawkins joined me. And Matt actually is uh, Chief Executive, CEO, Chief Investment Officer uh, for Kudo Ventures, one of the businesses that we're working with to precisely help with this funding structure to see his very exciting growing business. And then also Ralph Singleton, a man with a lot of experience in the investment world and also especially down in the Southwest, uh, head of funds Cornwall for the FSE group, if I got that right. So that's what we're here to try and do today. And what we want to be able to then see is to examine all the different areas and elements that we need to put together to try and make this work. So let me start first of all with Susanna, if I may. Yes. Okay, I'll have your views on this. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. So uh, I'm Susanna Adams, as I say, corporate finance partner at Milstead Langdon LLP. We're a, a southwest regional practice. We have four offices. So that's Bristol, Bath, Taunton and, uh, and Yeovil. And um, we, we offer a full service in terms of being able to take businesses from the cradle to the grave. My part is the, is the matchmaking and the mentoring of businesses that are either looking for some form of growth capital or looking for some form of um, capital for a particular purpose, whether that be acquisition or whether they're looking for exit. So anything that's transactional related is very much my area. And um, accordingly, um, as we are emerging, I feel, from what feels like the world's longest Christmas break, we've all had an awful lot of time to think about our businesses, to think about what we want to do next with them, to have actually have to assert of circumstances which has forced people to adapt and to think differently. So I think that there's a time of tremendous opportunity that we see here at the moment, but we're still operating, from my perspective, with, with, with tools that are very much of a, of, of a pre-pandemic era, which is why I'm really excited to be working with Regionally, because I can see it plugging some very, very important gaps in the, in the type of work that I experience. So one of my primary roles is navigating businesses, successful businesses, through the labyrinthine territories of finding finance. 
of enabling them to grow. And that is a quite a difficult task at the moment because the market is so fragmented. Um, Stuart referred to the fact that there were many, many exchanges back in the day. They, uh, from a, a later perspective, seemed to morph then more into more of a, an informal angel network type of structure that we, we had for some time. That had its benefits. But it was very, um, it was quite subjective in terms of, uh, of, of being able to access it, whether you were hitting the right people on the right day. So the chances of success with those sorts of networks was haphazard, in, in, my, in, in my opinion. Um, One of the things I found with that, Susanna, was actually also trying to make sure you got the right investors for the right companies. And if you end up with the wrong group of angels, you've got the money, but the wrong people. Indeed, in, indeed, Justin, and that's exactly the problem. Um, in so far as um, it was, it was down to. Uh, I liken it as um, having a, a Rembrandt. If you're going to sit on the edge of a drive with a Rembrandt and your only trade is passing trade from cars, you're never going to get the right deal that you will do by taking it to the right market at the right time. So um, in terms of what was available, yes, indeed, there was the, um, the, the angel networks, which were very hit and miss and um, now much more miss. They're, they've died out to a, to a great extent. A few strong ones have survived, but um, they are inundated with, um, with quality opportunities at the moment, so much so that we're, we're seeing really good opportunities being turned away. So that was the, the first option that we saw. And then um, also, if again, if it's in a particular sector or it's in a, of a particular size, it may appeal to, um, to private equity, to venture capital. London, very much London based. There are some local um, opportunities as well, but it's very, very, it tends to generally be guided by London, whether that be through, um, through being interested in particular um, fashions of business. There are certain things that appeal to investors at a particular point in time. So again, it's, it's going to miss quite a lot of good business opportunities. So uh, I see regionally as effectively using the technology of today in order to, um, to, to provide a, a more than um, discerning network and actually it will bring me on to the third option which was obviously crowdfunding oh. crowdfunding is a little bit of um in my it has its place it definitely has its place but again it's um it's very very um it's, it's almost depersonalized it's the very opposite of an angel network in so far as there's there is a, some rigor in terms of what comes onto the platform but that it's but sometimes attracting the wrong investors. As indeed, well, yeah. It? So you've you've got one situation where you probably have the right investors, but they don't have the reach, mm. and you've potentially got the wrong investors mm. with a with a, a national reach. So here we're bringing together the best of two, two worlds. And I think one of the frustrations I've found is that local investors often want to invest in local businesses. They know those businesses. Indeed. Often the people in London won't know it. It'll just be a provincial business over there. To what extent has EIS and some of the tax breaks had an impact as well? Does that, does that drive some of the decision making? It, it drives an awful lot of the decision making, yes, Justin. Um, particularly, we, we, most of the people that I, I work with who are looking for opportunities are looking for you know, some benefit from the tax breaks that they get oh. through the EIS investment. Um, so, yeah, that, 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 that is a big driver. Um, but again, in terms of the, the type of market that I'm dealing with, I'm finding that my work is is quite fragmented. Someone may have, you know, want to use an EIS compatible investment. There may be nothing out there that directly appeals to them. I may be able to find something, but my work is very hard in terms of um, marrying the right people up at the same time because oh. there is no proper um, and, and well-policed and, and regulated platform at the moment that does that. Right, and there seems to be a gap as well, and it's always been a traditional gap of funding, where you're almost too big to be small or too small to be big. So from sort of half a million up to about 10, 15 million, you know, the private equity people and you know, the city investors will, will find it too small and won't come near it. Um, but on the other hand, the private investors, they can't afford that sort of thing. So maybe again in the regions, that's where we'll find that sort of funding to be able to fill that gap. 
Uh, absolutely, absolutely, Justin. It, it, there used to be the old adage that that, that, that particular gap was the, um, the, the remit of friends, family and fools. Yeah. <laughs> but um, but that it's, that's, that's very unfair, actually, um, because there are some excellent businesses that have got tremendous growth potential, but the amount of, um, of, of capital that they need to raise is actually comparatively modest. And so I find it frustrating because on the continent you still find mechanisms to enable people to do this. But here we find companies get to a certain size and either they just get bought up by someone overseas uh, or a, a larger fish somewhere else. Yes. We don't seem to have the, the middle sized growing businesses. It, seem, it seems to vanish in our world. Absolutely. We're, we're seeing that more of that at the moment. I'm part of a network of international um, firms of accountants oh. and I, we have a a, a, um, an M&A specialist group and it was quite sad when I was reporting to that group for me to see that we in the UK we're, we're net sellers uh -huh. out, of, out of the country um, so we are more likely I think to sell our business overseas um, as a means of, of potentially of bridging a gap where the finance actually if it had been available the growth yeah. could have been achieved within the UK. I mean, it's flattering to know that we're setting up so many successful businesses, but you know, we go back to the days where we were the investors to the world, and then the dividends were coming back to us. And so we actually see the dividends going elsewhere, which Indeed. is always a shame. Yes. Susanna, thank you very much indeed. That's very helpful. We'll come back to some other questions a little later. So that gives you hope some background then as to why, from a business structural point of view, this sort of thing could be useful. But the reality, actually, how does it actually work? Is it going to work? Um, why would you do it? Well, here's a man, hopefully not a fool, but certainly a friend. Um, and um, we've actually seen this, Matt Hawkins. Matt, you've got a great history in your setting up businesses and actually yes. in your sector. Um, and for setting up Kudo, which I have to say, as a personal view, I think it's a very exciting business, but a small business growing fast. Um, what's the frustration that you found when you're trying to get yourself financed for the next stage? Yeah, I guess we've been through two from my last business and the current business. Um, and, uh, well, my last business, we were a data centre and cloud company. Um, the challenge is there is that you have to raise a lot of capital up front, which is very difficult. So that's always what slows down your growth. Um, and while that's slowing you down, you know, really that is slowing down your entire business. So on that business, and the problem is when you go to the banks and traditional finance, um, you know, unless you've got good revenue streams in, then it's really hard to get debt. Uh, and uh, the advantage that we did have is you could get asset finance debt, yeah. but that's it. You can't finance really the rest of the business. Um, so the banks really don't solve the problem for you here? No, yeah. no. They, 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 if you've got money, you can borrow money from banks, mm. it's always helpful. <laughs> which you don't always need at that point. I always point. find it frustrating. <laughs> I'll invest in you once you're profitable. Yes, thank you very much. But would you mind? I bet you've got to get to the first bit first. Yes, yeah, yeah exactly. Um, but that worked, but it was slow growth. You know, we, I ran that for 16 years. Um, you know, we so you started when you were 12? Yeah, yeah, basically. <laughs> okay. <laughs> By the way, if you have any questions, uh, then uh, please do ask me those, uh, send them through on the question sheet and we'll pick them up here and we'll make sure, we'll have, try and have time for them, otherwise we'll get back to you anyway. Matt, so, how do you then try and resolve these problems? Uh, so, well, in, in that business actually ended up being acquired um, uh, in the UK, uh, but this business, uh, this business that I've started now, you know, we're essentially uh, making cloud and blockchain more sustainable. In English, please. <laughs> uh, so we're using the world's unused computing ah, capacity. Yes, it's in other specs. Yeah. Um, so you don't have to build CO2 producing data centers and new servers and things. We can use what's already out there and make uh, the, you know, the internet and the cloud and, and what you've probably heard of blockchain, you know, more recently, um, more sustainable. That's what our goal is. Um, to create a more greener IT, really. So instead of wasting money and, and the environment on creating Bitcoin and things like that, we can do more creative things. But the yes. bit that, that, that really sold it to me, you were saying that for families who've just got their PCs, even their, their PlayStation and things like that, um, the available capacity they're not using, you can use. Yes, yeah. If you think of it, there's, there's one and a half billion games machines that are out there or over that. Um, all of those are just sat there 80% of the time doing nothing. So why not have it earned back for you? Um, same with PlayStation, you know, there's over 100 million PlayStation 4s out there uh, that aren't being used 80% of the time. You know, they just get used in the evening when people are gaming. 
Um, That's what if we saying. could use, yeah, exactly. Uh, if we could use that, you know, it would be incredible for the people that own this equipment because it's a new revenue stream, which is especially in COVID times what people need more. Mm. Um, and then also, you know, it's just much greener for the environment. So that was the whole idea. I, it's a very exciting story. So, what sort of investment do you want for that? I'm not so much in yeah. size. Going to talk about the size a bit later. But you know, the rare structure is it debt? Is it equity? What sort of what do, you, do you want investors? Yes. Well, because we were doing it as a uh, startup, and this is a software business, mm -hmm. and typically they grow much, much faster than infrastructure businesses, um, and. You need to grow the business quicker than you can actually raise debt because that takes a long time to get into that position. So we realised, okay, we've got to raise equity. Um, but then also you want to get some okay valuations to start with. So we did kind of the friends and family to begin with um, and yeah, contacts cool. that we knew. Yes, yeah, <laughs> not too many of those. <laughs> um, and that, that kind of, you know, that was good for getting us going. Um, and then we started to do the angel rounds. Um, and speaking with angels, uh, and this was pre-COVID, so that was a slow process. We would individually, well, we'd actually have to go find the angels in the first place. Um, and I'd go to events, or I'd be introduced to people, we'd go to London and all different locations to speak to people. Just go and sell yourself. Yeah, wow. you sort of sell yourself to an audience, and then you've got to follow up with lots of video calls, and um, but then also lots of other ones, and you're hoping for introductions, and probably a few hundred I spoke to in the end um, and that is okay to get going but it's it completely distracts your focus from the business and does it give you the investors you actually want I mean there are all sorts of um, different types of investors but to me it's not so much whether you like them or not you've got to get on with them yes all the opportunities I've seen throughout the years of various types of businesses and companies end up with shareholders and it's sort of shrug your shoulders but I just have to put up with them can you not yeah. can you, can you find you can select them a bit more uh, I would say when you start out, you're kind of glad to get any investment <laughs> and you're probably less picky, I would say, and you don't really have the luxury of being picky, yeah. you're like, okay, yeah, this is more, it's more important, you know, to get the raise than it is the choosing the right, so now you've got right to, at the beginning. you've got to this stage now, how much are you yeah. looking to raise now, you are raising now? Uh, yes, well, we, we have actually completed the raise, the last raise with, with Regionally as well. Um, and what I found out working with Regionally is that, you know, rather than, well, we put ourselves on, onto a platform mm -hmm. um, and then we get access to the entire network. So either, you know, hundreds or what, thousands of potential investors, um, rather than having to go see all these investors. And then the ones come to you that are interested, which is a much more scalable model. It's kind of a really more of an investment version um, of your more traditional uh, platform, you know, yeah. financing solution. But you're reversing the process. They're coming to you. You can select them as opposed to you yes. having to sell yourself to all these strange people. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And th and that was and it really accelerated the entire process as well. Right. There's a bit more time up front where mm -hmm. you've got to do your financial and you know legal due diligence, put things in place. But then actually the entire process afterwards is substantially faster. This is a question I might come back to Susanna for a bit later, because one of the issues is we found is making sure businesses are investable. Yes. Because you're perfectly good in perfectly good business, but how can you make sure that actually the, it's the sort of business that I can put my money into, you've got all the right elements there. Uh, yeah. Not many people unless they've told you what does an investable business look like and what did you have to do to try and get yourself into that position? Um, Firstly, you need a really good pitch deck. <laughs> that helps. Um, and that was useful. And we got, there's lots of information online on how to create a good pitch deck, but really you need feedback from investors and yeah. angels to let you know, you know, get it right. And you Once know, you've got that right, then it can... And I was looking at some of your non-execs as well, or people who yes, used to advise actually, you in that. So yeah. That seems to have been quite helpful. Yeah, yeah, we've got some amazing non-execs actually. Um, you know, we've got Chris Deere in the ex uh, president of Sony Entertainment, you know, he, right. ran, he ran PlayStation for 10 years. and That's quite useful. Yeah, um, we've got a, one of the top blockchain directors for AMD, you know, we've, we've got some really good people actually, and they, they put you in contact and network you as well, so I'd say as well as advising you on markets, they'll advise you on how to grow your business. Mm. Um, you know, Chris, we've had tens of thousands of staff, so you know, we want, we want people that have done this growth before. Yeah. Um, and I would say, yeah, so once you've got your decks right, once you've got the advisors in place, um, and I think you, you need to get your product right, naturally, product market fit. Mm. 
Uh, and one of the things we were talking about when we did a, did a film when we were uh, first starting out with you, it was actually, what do I as an investor get out of? What's the deal? Because obviously you want to have good investors, but the investors need to see a return. Is it capital gain? Is it a dividend? And things like that. Did you consider from the investor's point of view, actually, you know, what they what what? Because you, you don't want to, you can't give them everything, but you can be quite precise about what they can get. Yes, yeah. I think you need, as accurately as you can, you need forecasts. <laughs> Um, and they're as, as much as you know, really. Oh. Uh, and but then they need to be able to show, you know, when is the exit or what is the plan, because they want to you know, get, get a return on their investment, obviously. And I think one of the issues we wanted to make sure regionally was that uh, fact that their shares in this particular case, so in due course, to be able to trade them uh, yes. at a time which suits you rather than necessarily suits them. But it's a deal because um, markets are never liquid. But you can have a trading event in time to come, so that people, as well as investing in, can come out. But it's a time which is mutually beneficial. Um, and one of the things you were describing to me is actually, you know, how you want to have other shareholders coming in at the right time. So you need this flexibility, I think, of coming in and out. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's very true. Um, yeah, we, we already have a number of... So we oversubscribed our last round by quite a lot. Right. Um, and it's a good sign. Yeah, it's very good, actually. <laughs> uh, and there's kind of a waiting list for when we do our next round, um, which is a good place to be. But then the next round is actually purely strategic investors. Right. The really large partners that we want to work with. Um, and typically they want larger tickets, which also gives other past investors, if they want an opportunity to exit during that process. Well. Okay. Well, that's fascinating. So you've now got to the stage, you've raised the money, you're now applying that money. Uh, yes. It's investing and it's, it's on, on, the, on, the, on the way. Yes. Right. Yeah. So right. it's, I think without that, well, I know without that, we'd be growing much, much slower. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, and, and since, you know, the COVID release, then we've got, uh, well, every, everyone's online, you do all your video interviews online, yeah. so you get the, we're based in Bournemouth, so you get the savings of being a regional company without really the, the overheads, um, but you've still got just as big a selection of people to work with. And you have to schlep around the country or around the world trying to, trying to sell it off. Yes. Uh, well, and that, I think it's a great story, but it is a, a fascinating business and a product which, first of all, I have to go through very simply to understand, I now do understand it. So I think it's very exciting. Let's think a little bit more about uh, the region itself, southwest and south. Uh, and for that, I'm delighted that we've actually got then Ralph Singleton with us. Um, and Ralph, um, given your background and investing in the southwest and your career here and doing that, and now representing the Cornish funds and your connection with the Isles of Scilly as well, what do you think that the region needs? Um, capital. Um, That's good. In a simple word, <laughs> which is what we can provide and what regionally can, can provide us with. Um, and capital is required, as Matt was saying, to help businesses grow. And that capital can be in the form of equity or debt. Uh, and I was interested to hear what Matt was saying about not being able to borrow money from banks. Um, the Cornwall Large Silly Investment Fund uh, is able to offer debt based on projection, lend uh, projection lending. Um, so we're looking at forecasts. Uh, yes, we do look at what's happened historically to give us some indication of what the forecasts uh, are and whether they're achievable. But you know, ultimately, we can lend on that basis as well as investing. And where do these funds come from? Are these government monies or? Yeah, the, the fund is um, supported by the um, European Regional Development Fund and the British Business Bank. And we also work closely with the um, Cornwall's and Isles City Local Enterprise Partnership. Does the European bit drop out now? Um, or it, we just don't talk about it quite we so much? It, we're part of the 50 billion you know, settlement, I guess. Um, ah. So it, it is running. Until, You're in the deal somewhere. We're in the deal somewhere until 2023 or whatever the period ends. Uh, so that money is there. It's a £40 million fund. Uh, we've still got plenty to, to invest. Um, our only remit for this particular fund is the businesses have to be in Cornwall or have a material part in their Cornwall. So I guess if Matt um, wanted to set up a fairly material part of his business in Cornwall because he was attracted to some you know, set of you know, skills that were down there, we could fund that. But probably nine out of ten companies are generally going to be based in Cornwall, having the majority of their business in Cornwall. What I find fascinating in Cornwall is actually how little knowledge there is in Cornwall of the businesses in Cornwall, it, apart from mining, which of yeah. course is well, yeah. historic, yeah. Um, uh, and it's when you go to some of the business parks and things and then go back to elsewhere in the country and then you go, really? We didn't know it was there? But actually, people in Cornwall, I suppose they know about fishing, but yeah. uh, didn't see about it. There are lots 
a very broad range of businesses yeah. I've come across. But, yeah, big big range of companies. I mean, Cornwall, as you say, gets known for the mining and, and perhaps the tourism at the moment because everybody's going to come on holiday to Cornwall this year, apparently. Uh, so yeah. that will be a, a lot of fun. But yes, in, in terms of the investments we've made, we've um, made investments in the med tech sector, software companies not a million miles away from Matt's business, um, marine sector. Um, so there's plenty, you know, plenty of opportunity there. Uh, the media sector is quite strong down there. Um, accounting software businesses, uh, a great range and some great technology uh, down there, uh, supported also by uh, the universities. Falmouth University is, is a growing force uh, and they've got a, a launch pad entrepreneurship program as well, so we work closely with them. So, but there must be quite a bit of money in Cornwall, even if it's retirement money, um, but I suspect there's no way, no mechanism for anyone in Cornwall to invest in Cornwall. No, well, there are a few, but it's not as, not as big. There are a couple of angel networks, but as Susanna was saying, mm. um, it, it doesn't take too long to use, use their capacity and you, you only have to have one deal that goes wrong and they lose confidence. Um, so we, we work, we, we, we're very keen, our, our investment policy um, is actually to always invest alongside other people. Uh, because for, for, some, for, for several reasons. One, it helps uh, have like-minded investors on board and you know, I would see regionally as being a like-minded investor to, to Coisif. Um, so that when a company such as that has an next round, you, know, you have some capacity internally to raise it from existing shareholders. Yes, the next round may involve a larger VC or a larger external investor or corporate investor, um, but you've got the capacity to be able to help those companies through perhaps some difficult times occasionally before mm. they get to the stage where they can raise the, the big money. Um, so we'll work with you know, people like regionally, we'll work with a range of networks, we'll work with you know, other VCs, uh, we'll work with corporates, um, we'll work with individual angels, anybody who can help us uh, provide additional funding alongside us to help the company uh, to grow. Uh, our chief executive at Regionally, Jim O'Dell, who's been really the business driving force behind this, uh, really uh, identified very quickly uh, that, uh, actually what demand there is around the country for businesses in the South and Southwest and finding connections with different areas. Uh, I think there was one particularly to do with a set of breweries up in the Northwest who are actually interested in the set down in the, in the Southwest. Yeah. And so raising the profile of Cornwall in the Southwest as a, an investment area, other than, as you say, just merely, oh, it's well, tourism and, uh, and, and uh, old mining, um, when there's a lot more going on there. We, we need to find a greater awareness of this. What, what else can you think we can do in the Southwest to actually create greater enthusiasm for, for investment in the region? Well, it's, it's in infrastructure at the end of the day. So, you know, the roads, schools, education, to give you a background, um, because it's all well and good setting up a company in the Southwest, you've then got to employ people. So you need a, a pool of people with, with good technology. Now, one of the interesting things post-pandemic is we've all learned how to you know, work on, uh, on video calls and Teams and Zoom and, and the like. So it is now possible to remote work. You don't need to go and see somebody in London. So you don't need to be in London to run your business. You can be in the regions and run your business. Uh, and now we've got funds that are able to do that. Our funds, with the help of regionally, we can support those businesses to grow yeah. in, in those regions. And Wi-Fi in Cornwall used to be a bit of a joke, but I think it's certainly changed a bit now, hasn't it? Yeah. yeah, Yeah. well, we've uh, our first investment was in a business called Wildernet, uh, which was aimed at providing wide area Wi-Fi to provide effectively broadband, um, um, super fast broadband and ultra fast broadband to individuals and businesses uh, in Cornwall, where they were quite hard to get to. You know, BT Open Reach are not very keen to dig up 10 miles of farm track to get a farmer um, a broadband, but we, we can provide that. Uh, so that was our first investment and it's been a, a great success. In fact, we've just recently attracted a £50 million investment in uh, from the Gresham Strategic Fund uh, to further development, develop that business. And uh, that will provide a great base for Cornwall, you know, for, for the companies we're likely to be investing in, mm. as well as the, the company itself. And I've seen more, developed more business parks in Cornwall, certainly, um, yeah. and, become, and I think some very exciting businesses there, but the common thread I see, saw with all of them was they were small businesses starting up successfully, great ideas, yeah. but no idea about trying to help where they can actually get, get their, okay. their growth money from. No, no, that's certainly the, the case, and um, they've been well supported by, by government, and there are a number of uh, grant schemes in various sectors, so there's the Marine Eye Project that's helping the marine industry, there's the aerospace hub at uh, Newquay Airport, uh, which is you know, where Richard Branson's uh, setting up his space business, there's a space cluster there, and there's the launch pad at, at Falmouth, and there's all associated business parts run by these organisations to support uh, local businesses, you know, from 
one man right through to you know 10, 20, 30 and you know, they can grow with, with those businesses. All right. And those are I think some very exciting concepts there. They certainly raise the profile that way. Well, I'm pleased to say also that actually we even had some political interest in what we're doing. Um, very kindly, Alex Chalk, who's the MP for uh, Cheltenham, uh, and uh, he's been very interested in what we've been doing regionally, because apart from the else at Cheltenham, they've got the new science park, and with some good business ideas there. And what does a science park need? Well, not just businesses, good lo and behold, it needs investment as well. Uh, so very kindly, Alex uh, put some time aside to actually record uh, some of his views on it for us. Uh, he was going to do it live, but we didn't necessarily trust, actually, that uh, the House of Commons uh, internet is actually that good. So we did it beforehand, so it's slightly cheating. So, please, can I introduce uh, Alex Chalk? Hi, my name is um, Alex Chalk. I'm the Member of Parliament for Cheltenham, and I'm also the uh, Prisons and Probation Minister, although I'm, I'm speaking very much in a, uh, in a capacity as a constituency MP. And I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to say a few words and to um, support this event and I'm going to be saying a little bit about how uh, Cheltenham, which is my seat as I've indicated, and Gloucestershire more generally are looking to respond to this pandemic. And I really want to talk about one thing in particular, which is uh, the growth of cyber, a word which can mean a, a million things, but let me just try to develop it. And also to talk about what we're doing is not in and of itself um, uh, done as a result of the pandemic, but something that was starting before and is being accelerated uh, through it. So let me just give some of the background, if I may. What actually is cyber? Well, the truth is it can mean a million things to a million people. In the context that I'm talking about, it's cyber security. So in particular, there's this growth industry which exists, which is in effect the digital equivalent of burglar alarm system in old money, uh, to ensure that our um, online platforms are secure, that they're safe from hackers and so on, and that the, the digital front door of so many of our businesses is not left wide open. This is a, a growth industry, as you know, we all be familiar with um, recent cyber hacking scandals. They're terribly damaging reputationally as well, as, of course, potentially from a regulatory point of view and uh, and indeed for, for, well, for many other reasons. Once the data goes missing, that can of itself have a cost to businesses. So that's all terribly interesting, but why am I, as the Member of Parliament for Cheltenham, uh, talking particularly about cyber? Well, even if you would normally think of Cheltenham for the races, and you could be forgiven for that, or indeed the shopping, and you could be forgiven for that too, some of you will of course be aware that GCHQ is here in Cheltenham. And that's very important because when I was first standing for election back in 2014, I very much wanted to have a, a plan for what what would be the point of getting elected? What did I want to do? And one of the key things I wanted to do is to ensure that the, the huge state-backed muscle of GCHQ, which of course absorbs a lot of public money, perfectly properly, but also absorbs a lot of the expertise in this sector, perfectly properly, was there to actually support the local economy to a far greater extent. Now, what had happened historically is there was a big um, sort of... Uh, almost like a psychological barrier which came from government, which in effect said we should not be using the assets of the state to provide kept competitive advantage to specific businesses. And that was that was very much a sort of article of faith. And I, I pushed back on that when I got elected. I said, well, no, this is ridiculous. If you go to places like Israel, where there they have, and this is a, this is a figure to conjure with, a country of, what is it, about seven or eight million, leave aside the, the politics, which of course are, are, are difficult, but a country of seven or eight million or whatever it is, that country attracts a full 25% of global venture capital when it comes to cyber security. Extraordinary thing, that's why they call themselves the startup nation and so on. So I was sitting there thinking, well, why, should, why shouldn't we be doing something similar here in the UK? So I started to look at what they do in, in, in Israel. And there they take their equivalent of GCHQ, which I think is called 8200, 8100, whatever it's called. It's parked in the Negev desert very close to their equivalent of Cambridge University, so Ben Gurion University. And close by there, they've got something called CyberSpark, which is a place where civilian businesses are often supported by the very experts who sit in their military intelligence apparatus to, to support, these, um, support these businesses. And I thought, wow, we should be doing something like that here in Cheltenham. And so what's happening already 
is that uh, the government has supported a cyber innovation centre, which was actually launched by George Osborne, remember him, uh, when he was at GCHQ in, in 2015. It's something that I encouraged him to launch, a cyber innovation centre in Cheltenham. And that is supported by some of the finest minds in GCHQ. So the plan is, as we build back from the pandemic, is to actually create a cyber park cheek by jowl with GCHQ to the west of GCHQ, which provides uh, the, att the attraction, a cyber innovation center, a badged and avowed building where some of these uh, brilliant startups can be uh, fostered by, by, the, by the likes of these great minds that come in and out. And that in and of itself provides an attraction to a number of the, of the suppliers, you know, the likes of BAE Systems and Northrop Grumman. I'm not necessarily suggesting that they're going to move into the cyber park, but there are a lot of suppliers uh, who would find that a space quite attractive. So the government's got behind it. We had £22 million to do the civils, as it were, you know, to improve the transport network, to open up this uh, patch of land. Um, GCHQ is, is, is funded for its cyber innovation centre, and that's what we want to deliver in the future. And for places like Cheltenham, which traditionally has felt a little bit like, well, hang on, we're not really in the southwest. We're not really in the Midlands. We're certainly not in the Thames Valley, uh, Valley and we're certainly not in Wales. So wh where, where do we fit? Well, this sort of thing allows us to turn a liability into an asset. In fact, we're very well placed to go to Bristol or to go to Birmingham or to go to Cardiff or indeed to head down uh, towards Swindon. And taken together with the infrastructure investment which is coming, so it's not all just about levelling up the north, but there's infrastructure investment, for example, the air balloon roundabout, which some of you may know about, but bluntly is a, a, a traffic bottleneck, half a billion pounds to try to fix that. If we sort out the infrastructure, if we continue with things like the cyber park, uh, then I think we need to be focusing on those high-end, high-value jobs, which where we do in the UK have a distinct competitive uh, advantage. So those are just some opening, um, a, a few remarks. I could talk all about all sorts of things, the government's kickstart scheme. I'd love to talk about local planning and how we're pivoting from uh, retail space into residential, but perhaps, um, perhaps that would be trying your patience a little too far. So... Uh, Thank you for inviting me to say a few words. Cyber is the future. Don't forget Gloucestershire. Come to Cheltenham by all means, but don't just go for the races. Come for the tech too. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. That was very kind of you to spend some time to do that for us. Nice to know that Cheltenham, they can run to the GCHQ very effectively, but still can't work a roundabout. Um, but uh, such are the things that that's only going to happen in Britain, really, can't it? Um, I found it fascinating there. I mean, when you actually sit there and rather than think about some of the, the ideas that governments come out with, there's always seems a huge difference with what they talk about in Parliament and actually what then happens on the ground. Um, you're all about the closest we've got to it. Um, so actually seeing some tangible differences. And we've got things such as the British Business Bank, or in Scotland we've got Scottish National Investment Bank. Uh, are they making tangible difference? And if so, what should we be doing? Should we be working with them? Yeah, very much so. And you, um, several of our funds at FSC run, um, both in Cornwall, but we also run funds for the Midlands Engine Fund as well. We have a, a 42 million debt fund there, and we also have a 55 million debt fund in London. Um, so the British, British Business Bank is probably one of the best kept secrets in the in the country in terms of the amount of money that they are controlling and in, uh, indirectly through businesses like FSC investing in, in the regions. Um, and one question we've actually had from Sir Adrian Montague, so we may know in terms of uh, being very successful in, in business and city and leading some of our leading companies. I wonder whether, what the panel would think about potentially regionally or anything else, actually creating a new private um, uh, uh, 3i private equity company, because 3i blended very effectively over the years. I remember correctly, I think Sir Adrian Montague chaired it for a while uh, during that very successful period. We seem to be lacking that. We've got private equity, but that sort of blend of government and, uh, um, and private equity. Do you think three, a new 3i could be called for? Possibly. Um, I, mean, I think the British Business Bank might claim they're doing some of it, although they're clearly subcontracting out some of that uh, finance to organisations. But uh, um, there are you know, there are organisations out there who are operating regionally, the likes of Maven and Midven and other uh, you know, other venture capital businesses, and indeed FSE. Uh, who are trying to provide that and 
I guess uh, we could all come together and be the next 3i or the British Business Bank can bring us all together and be the next 3i. Yeah. But certainly do it on a regional basis, but also yeah. I think well, providing that opportunity of not just investing, being, being able to, as you were saying earlier, being at some stage divest, sell out yeah. of the fund, out of the stock or whatever it happens to be. I found that fascinating. Um, Susanna, come back to you. Um, when you were, we were talking a little bit earlier about making companies investable, I've got a question coming through here. Uh, what do you look for in a company where you make investments? And what, what do I, how do you sh make sure these companies are actually investable? Uh, because they may be running perfectly good as a business, maybe run by an individual or a family or something like that, but not really fit for purpose for external investors. Uh, absolutely. So um, we, we work with businesses and we, we pick up what they know best, which is their markets, their customer base, um, their, their product they're offering. And uh, we, uh, um, we work with them then to um, assess the, the, the projections, the, the business plan, which as Matt said is something that you worked on um, quite early on. And we are looking for uh, how that, whether the, whether the growth from a top-down or a bottom-up position, um, slightly bizarre, but what, what I mean by that is from a, from a top-down perspective, are, are, is what is being said about the sales, the, the potential, is it realistic compared with what the market is offering? Bottom-up, can they get the resource in to actually deliver this level of work? So it's challenging those assumptions to make sure that they are reasonable and sustainable, and then it's looking at what sort of return that is likely to generate for an investor, looking at the valuation that the future earnings potential will bring to a business, and does it make sense? Oh. And uh, does it ever get personal in terms of check, uh, checking whether they've got the right people there? Actually saying, good business, but unfortunately that one doesn't look so good. Uh, absolutely, it can do, and it's it's important then that, that um, people like regionally are working with good advisors that are able to sometimes deliver those hard messages where, where needed. Mm. Matt also mentioned the importance, you said, of your, your, um, uh, your non-executive directors or your, the, the people giving, giving you advice and support. Yeah. And all business people have this vision in mind that they're going to retire and become NEDs to all sorts of people and get lots of money for doing apparently not a lot. Um, are they useful? Uh, they, they, they have their place if they if they are um, being sourced. So in, some of them are. <laughs> yeah, well, um, uh, it used to be, the angel networks occasionally in the past were, were something uh, slightly um, uh, disrespectful, but a, a poser's paradise for those sorts of people. And it's, which is why I, it's so good now that people like Matt are experiencing investors coming to them rather than, because in the olden days I was, I was taking so many um, princesses to so many frogs. And it's so good that there is some, you know, there is a mechanism now where we can actually meet and look at these people rather than in a fragmented market. You don't quite know what you're getting into. And certainly I think we can all learn from other people. I mean, so, because it's the business when you're in a startup phase, you do just about anything. You do need people yeah. with a little bit more maturity to understand and also to have some experience of when things go wrong, what you have to do to try and get them right again. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely, and, and that's the important thing, which is why I say bringing in people that have been through that sort of experience before, have survived um, some particularly bad challenges, um, it's, it's very useful to do. Uh, Matt, in your world, your interest is, your sector is not unknown for some interesting egos um, mm -hmm. and, uh, <laughs> and uh, developing technology, very successful people, but they must be a nightmare to try and actually work with, dealing with Mr Musk and others. Because um, it's very much his uh, his business, I suspect, and they want us to just push around. How do you make sure you get the right sort of people? You need the te technicians there, but you also need to make sure you've got the right characters and personalities. And your industry doesn't always lend itself to so the most balanced of personalities. <laughs> I'm not talking about you. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I guess I mean you when you're. Employing you, you do need a whole mix of characters and a whole mix of people because you need pessimists and optimists. If everyone's an optimist, you're going to miss all the problems that are going to pop up. So oh. you, you do need kind of a good rounded team, I think. Um, when you're going through people that are at board level or advisors, then they have to have done it beforehand. You know, in my view, you, you know, if you need to scale, because otherwise everybody's learning by error. Um, so if, if you bring in people that have already done the growth, but I think I would say people that have done the growth up to maybe hundreds of staff, you know, is very different to someone that's run a company of 10,000 people. So, you know, find the right character suited to the right type of business. 
I think if you, if you literally get someone that's purely done a corporate lifestyle and, and you bring them into a startup, those characters, from my experience, and others that I've seen typically don't match. Mm. Um, but if you have someone that's already done startups, then they know that process. And, you know, so I think also, you know, just talk talk to the people that you want to work with and just do your personalities get along. Yeah. It's as, more, as important as anything because the worst thing, especially if you've brought in, you know, it, and it could be... Uh, Investors as well that are, are observers or that are on the board. You know, if you if you're not getting along with them personality wise, it, it can be that you're not enjoying running your business anymore. But this is an interesting point because actually, then in, in investors, what do you look for? It's not just the money. Um, do you want sometimes people with the expertise? Not to say to have them as not exact directors, but are they sometimes suppliers? Are they sometimes consumers? I don't mean necessarily retail consumers. No. Um, you know, but are, you know, what, where are you looking for people to participate in the business? Yeah, for, from an investment perspective, I find the uh, ideal ones are they're in the same sector yeah. or they're either in sectors that we want to get into that can give us the experience that we don't have. So really, it's, it's about networking, uh, bringing potential partnerships um, and experience. Those are the three most important things. Okay. Because if, you've got, if you get all three, then, then fantastic. And actually, quite a lot of our investors are that as well. But it also means, you know, that... Quite a lot of our investors, you know, they, they're not paid advisors or anything. Mm. They've got a vested interest mm. and also they enjoy the sector. So mm. actually you could call them up anytime and just go, you know, ask for a bit of advice. So you're not including your cost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, typically a, a fair number of those would have invested because they understand your sector. So they're, they're perfect. So we probably find, you know, it's probably at least half of our investors we could call up any time. And I know they'd be able to get us into contacts or... Yeah. or um, help us with growth. And in the past, people often talked about, you know, as we mentioned with Ralph and Glow, about hubs and how they were working, and you've seen the hubs in the tech world, the Silicon Roundabout, Silicon Fen, Silicon Glen. Bournemouth? Why, why Bournemouth? There is a Bournemouth hub. There is? <laughs> yeah. Right, okay, I missed it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. I'm very pleased to hear it. There, there is, I think, most places you go to, I think you'll find uh, uh, hubs, you know, Bristol hubs and, and other ones. You know, right. the, uh, Bournemouth and, and Bristol are kind of in the southwest, we consider the, the two largest media sites and, and locations for startups. Right. So, um, well, but, nice to hear it. I'm sure yeah. there's <laughs> going on. The, um, and I find it fascinating, though, that uh, it's one of the key issues, I presume, is actually trying to make sure you get the right recruiting, the right talent. Um, yeah. And you've mentioned before how difficult that can be. Um, presumably, you're having to plan for talent a year or so ahead for all of this. How do you try and manage that? Uh, I would say we plan about three months ahead because <laughs> when you're growing that fast, you know the, the, the business is changing yeah. um, and actually the business can be completely different in 12 months to how you originally planned it. Um, so yeah, we are recruiting three to six months in advance yeah. of where we need people. Um, and that, certainly locally with experienced people in that sector is quite challenging. So now we you know, we, we go through all the free ones and LinkedIn and mm. all these other platforms. Um, but also, you know, you have to use agencies in reality if you're going, growing fast. So we have those uh, that provide us in all different sectors, yeah. mostly around the UK, although we do have some European as well now. So where do you see uh, Kilo in five years? Um, that we will have, well, <laughs> as a platform, you know, one of the world's largest compute networks. Yeah. That's, it's growing fast. It's, do you, do you expect to be, uh, to be purchased, or you have to be purchased, or it's just uh, you're going to carry on growing? Um, I think that we will have, you know, naturally, you know, because I've done this process before as yeah. well. You know, we naturally we will have a lot of interest from the larger, you know, cloud companies, infrastructure companies. If you've got a large global network, um, but also in the blockchain space, you know, we, we're powering. A, if yeah. you understand blockchain, <laughs> um, we're powering a lot of the compute networks that are out there. Right. So I think it's just growth on a global scale that we maintain. Knowing you, you're going to be doing it again as well, aren't you? I suspect. <laughs> <That's possible. laughs> yeah. So actually, when you look at this, I mean, so, so now, all this has changed really quite radically, I think, over the past past few years, um, because we had this great enthusiasm in, of investment, but it all went to the, the big companies. We had AIM, but AIM has lost its way, it's expensive, very liquid, that's hard to surprise with small companies, hasn't got a great reputation, and again, is London focused. Um, what else can we do to try and make sure that the, uh, that the, the, the region is highlighted, um, but also to attract more investors in? And if and it's successful, you start attracting more companies coming in as well. What else does the region have to do? 
Um, well, make it easy to do that, in fairness. And um, so uh, we, within the South West, or within any region really, um, it, it is all about um, increasing awareness of what we've got, having um, a, a platform for, for bringing that awareness um, to, 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 the, um, to the wider um, audience and having somewhere actually where the wider audience that is interested in investing in a specific in a specific region, people that are um, looking for options with what to do with their money, maybe looking out again towards maybe the um, you know financial advisor um, world to say look there are options for people that want to invest within a specific area and um, want to invest within a, within a sector and a community that they understand. Right. Okay. And certainly when it comes to, um, well, in terms of uh, Cornwall, um, it's always missed out. Uh, it, everyone's heard of it, everyone knows about it, it's a nice place to go on a holiday, but it's not the business centre. Uh, what you're doing is, is, is a great start, well you've been doing it some time, and it's obviously had some success, I've seen some great businesses there. But you need to get it to a, the next stage. In a perfect world, what do you want? In a perfect world, what do you want? Um, the, we need to build up the ecosystem more, so more um, professional people to help companies become investable. We talked about that before. Um, you know, one question is, what is an investable company? And, yeah. and you know, we talked about a little bit about management. You know, what do we look at in terms of for, for management teams? You know, I think some people talk about three or four legged stools. Um, you, you probably want a good strategic um, man who's got the, the entrepreneurial flair. You probably need a good CTO of some description who understands the technology fully and can give investors full confidence that you're at the forefront of your, your game and you need somebody who can sell it and market it. And then probably the fourth one may or it could be various or it could be finance, it could be operational in terms of sort of back office support type function, but it needs some full work. But the, the, in terms of the area, we need an, infra an infrastructure in the area to work. So we need financial advisors. We need other investors to help us provide the capital to the company. We need education establishments to provide the technical skills for the employees to work for those companies. Um, so yeah, those are I think, the key aspects of property. I mean, they, yeah. sometimes they need somewhere to work. I mean, yeah. right, we can all work from home nowadays, but actually having the right facilities for companies to be to base in. So we, you need to work closely with the local authorities. Uh, as it seems sometimes seems a mismatch with me when I sort of see what's coming out of the business schools and actually what's happening in real business reality. The, that's the textbook way of running a business and the, the real dirty world of actually running a business. Yeah. And sometimes they need more practical experience in there to really people come up and understand what it's like. Yeah. No, we're, we're very keen on, uh, on experience but you know, work together with entrepreneurial um, and young generation to you know, bring in new ideas to organisations. And that, and that uh, needs, a, to, needs a good mix of both. It, yeah, I find it very exciting, and it's, it, it, something didn't happen when my age of growing up. I'm asking my, my mother, asking me what I wanted to do, and I said I'd like to have my own business. And she said, Oh my God, you want to go into trade? You realise we have a separate door for that. And so the whole middle class attitude towards the trade was something rather unpleasant. Now we're a nation of entrepreneurs. Well, where on earth that's come from? We'll be watching Dragon's Den. Um, but we've become a nation of entrepreneurs without necessarily making sure that right infrastructure is there to support that all the way through. Um, and I think you're a great example of, of actually not doing it once, doing it twice. But that's just embarrassing. I mean, I've you know, struggled my way through mine. But that's great. Someone's asked me here about uh, regionally, so forgive me if I talk a little bit for a second. Where does regionally, what does regionally look like in, say, five years' time? Well, I would I like regionally in five years' time to be regionally across the whole United Kingdom with the regions having greater highlight and profile of themselves, attracting more money into their regions and not going into London. Investors in those regions knowing they can invest there, but also attracting money from elsewhere. And it's not just in the UK. Um, uh, Jim and I have already had uh, contacts from people saying, I'd like to invest in Britain, but there must be other things beyond London, because that's all they get to hear and see. Um, and so to me, I'd love to see that as a nationwide uh, success, and maybe even then having the funds for the counties, for the regions, so those companies can be represented in those funds, so small investors can buy into that. And even on the back of that, uh, a region having a bit like a FTSE 100, having a, uh, you know, a regional index as well, to actually fly the success or, uh, of, uh, of that. So I think there's a lot to try and do here. Um, and what I find encouraging is uh, the, the pandemic has been awful, but the demand for capital has never been so important. The entrepreneurial enterprise has never been so strong. 
we've just got to try and make sure that actually happens from here. Uh, thank you all three of you for your help today. It's been really helpful. Thank you for your spending time uh, watching us today. Um, please do continue to send in questions and we'll get back to you, I promise, uh, with, uh, uh, with answers. There is no such thing as a stupid question. It's pretty many stupid answers, I'm afraid, but hopefully not too many from me. Um, and so I hope that's given you a flavour of what's happening uh, in the South and West with Regis starting here and with the first companies coming through and with Matt, with Kudo already uh, finding his funding and as you heard already growing. So I think there's a lot more to be done and we look forward to more success happening here. What happens next? Well, there'll be other regions that they're already putting their hands up in the northeast and the northwest and the Midlands who actually want to do the same. And this, I think, once it starts gathering momentum, uh, will actually attract, I think, much more exciting investment in businesses that people know about, they're connected to, they get to see. Um, and I think that local connection with business and investment in those businesses can only be beneficial. So thank you, Matt. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Suzanne. That's very kind of you. Thank you very much indeed for watching. That's really all from us now. Best of luck with your uh, own investing. And if you have any questions from the team here or from regionally, please do let us know. Thank you very much indeed. Bye-bye.